At 20 minutes past midnight on the 31st of August 1997, Princess Diana and Dodi Al-Fayed set out from the Ritz Hotel in central Paris. And of the four people in her Mercedes, only the bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, would survive. When Princess Diana died, the world wanted to know why and exactly how. Two hours after the crash, French police arrested seven paparazzi for manslaughter. It was claimed their high-speed chase had caused the deaths. 30 hours later, the French authorities changed the story dramatically. Now the fault was the drivers. Henri Paul was drunk and on medication. Following a French government inquiry in 1999, this explanation remains the official cause of the accident and the deaths of Diana, Dodi and their driver. But now we know that the official version is simply not true. The investigating magistrate and the prosecution wanted to come to an end because there was too much pressure, because no one would know the real truth anyway. So it had to be stopped. So it was stopped. And of course, not everything has been inquired on. We've been allowed to film the 27 volumes of confidential evidence the French inquiry gathered. None of these documents have been seen before. The files raise a number of very worrying questions about the inquiry. Why was the scene of the accident scrubbed clean and opened within four hours of the crash, destroying valuable forensic evidence? Why was the traffic police investigation not included in the official inquiry report? Why was the first witness on the scene ignored and silenced by the police? Why was the autopsy carried out on Henri Paul so blatantly inaccurate? And why were the secret service connections of both Henri Paul and another key witness never properly explored? One of our discoveries was this photograph of the Mercedes and its occupants taken just seconds before the crash. Many vital questions have never been properly pursued, let alone answered. And that appears to be no accident. In July 1997, Princess Diana and her children spent two weeks in Saint-Tropez as guests of the Al-Fayeds. She was a free woman, just divorced and just out of a two-year love affair. Three weeks later, Diana went back without her children to join the Al Fayed family on their new 12 million pound yacht, the Johnny Cal. During the cruise, Diana made very public her new romance with Dodi Al Fayed. The couple gave great headlines. Princess of the paradox, Diana yo-yoed between posing for stills and pleading for privacy. On Saturday the 30th of August, Diana, Dodi and bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones flew by private plane from Sardinia where the Johnny Carl had moored. They were bound for Paris. The security teams couldn't understand why the paparazzi seemed to be so well informed about their movements. And that wasn't the only thing that bothered Trevor. He complained that Dodi was always overruling his, Trevor's, recommendations on security issues. He recalls leaving the airport in Sardinia and arriving at the airport at Le Bourget. Of course, there was a large number of uh, paparazzi who they always seem to know were the movements of the couple uh, almost as soon as the bodyguards knew them. Fabrice Chasserie is a photographer and he caught a moment in history. 
Là, on voit Trevor et, euh, et Kiss Winfield qui descendent de l'avion avec des bagages. The first time all those in the doomed Mercedes met. Suivi par Diana, direct. Là, nous, euh, à ce moment-là, on était à peu près vers euh, au niveau de la douane. Pareil. Là, on aperçoit euh, Henri Paul. Dodie was close to Henri Paul, deputy head of security at the Ritz. He is one of the key personalities of the night and a man with a complicated past. Henri Paul, who was the second in charge of security at the Ritz Hotel and was uh, sort of press gang into being the chauffeur that night at the last minute, he, he was a long standing um, agent for MI6, uh, an agent in terms of uh, supplying information to MI6 about the goings on in the Ritz Hotel in return for cash. And he'd been working for MI6 since, um, well, I'd seen his file for the first time in 1992. And uh, from memory, he'd been working for MI6 for a few years prior to that. The Secret Service connection was confirmed by Henri Paul's best friend, Claude Garrick. Moi, j'ai toujours su qu'il avait des rapports avec les services secrets, mais dans le cadre de son travail. Mm -hmm. Pas dans un cadre d'aller de, 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 trahir qui que ce soit, mm -hmm. ou de monter des opérations mm -hmm. à son compte. C'est complètement encore une faux fantaisiste. C'est ça, c'est le fait qu'il occupe cette fonction dans cet hôtel qui qu l'a mis en rapport. Oui, évidemment. Et anglais mais en anglais, de tout, euh, je veux dire... Euh, tout, et... tout, tout type de services secrets. Arabes, israéliens, tout ce que vous voulez. Je veux dire, du moment où le, le, cet hôtel-là n'a pas spécialement une clientèle plutôt qu'une autre. The inquiry faced a politically sensitive issue, deciding how much of Henri Paul's past it could reveal. And this was not the only difficult decision. Henri Paul accompanied Diana and Dodie to the Villa Windsor, the mansion Edward VIII and Mrs. Simpson had lived in in Paris, a property the Al Fayed family had bought. I think she was aware that she was a potential Duchess of Windsor, a sort of loose cannon who they were going to watch very carefully, and she was not averse to upsetting them. And I think she quite enjoyed how much the affair with Dodie would upset everybody back at Buckingham Palace, as indeed it did, and a bit of in-your-faceness was in her nature. They drove to Dodie's flat. Number one, Rue Arsène Jose, near the Etoile. Dodie had booked a table at a smart Parisian restaurant, but at a quarter to ten, he cancelled because there was a crowd outside. Diana and Dodie returned to the Ritz, the great hotel owned by Dodie's father, Mohammed Al Fayed. The couple ate in the restaurant. She had soul, he had turbot, and then they went up to the £6,000-a-night Imperial Suite. Previous occupants included Hermann Goering, Winston Churchill and Woody Allen. Henri Paul left work at 7 p.m. Two hours later, he was asked to return to the Ritz. Henri Paul's ultimate boss at the Ritz is also the owner of Harrods in London. Mohamed Al Fayed still ponders what happened that night. Dodi called me. It was about 12 o'clock. He said, "Just I'm going now to the apartments." And he told me, "It's a lot of paparazzi. I don't know what they do. The Plus One Dome is full of people." I told him, "Please, it's so dangerous. Just stay in a hotel. Everything is there." No need for you to go out. He told me, I think I will follow your advice. Why? After Dodi assured me that he's not going to go out, uh, Paul, uh, Henry Paul, gone to him at 12 o'clock after Dodi talking to me and convinced him, no problem, we're going to go from the back entrance, everything is okay, don't worry, I know the way. 
And please, you know, because you have already prepared everything there, change Dodi's mind. Dodi followed him up, and he said, because all the region is there, they have the champagne, they have the party, they're in their apartment. Henri Paul, part-time MI6 man, would help Dodi devise a plan to outwit the paparazzi. This amateur video is the only record of what was happening outside at the front of the Ritz. Ooh, someone's out, they're very important. Tourists and paparazzi wait for the glamorous couple. Henri Paul tells the crowd the couple will be leaving soon in this, their Mercedes. Five minutes later, the clever ploy, a second Mercedes, pulls up by the back door of the Ritz. Ori Paul, Princess Diana, Dodie, and Trevor Reese Jones get in. Paul takes the wheel. Meanwhile, at the front of the Ritz, people scramble into their cars, realizing they've been fooled. Using two Mercedes might not be vintage James Bond, but it gave Diana and Dodie's car a head start. Chasing Princess Diana. The quickest way from the Ritz to Dodie's flat was up the Champs Elysees, but at the Concorde, the car turned left instead of right. It then raced along the riverbank of the Seine. It was now actually going away from Dodie's flat, but the French inquiry never asked why they were taking this route. It is a mystery why they were where they were because there are many different ways of getting to the um, apartment that they were going to at the top of the Champs-Élysées without going via the Champs-Élysées. Where they were, it's inexplicable. Our access to the files reveals that most witnesses did not see the actual crash because they were either at the entrance or the exit of the tunnel. It's amazing that one crucial witness who was behind the Mercedes was ignored by the inquiry. His name is Eric Patel. Patel was not the only person to hear a strange noise. Clive Guravudu, who was on the bridge above the Alma Tunnel, he and also was a chauffeur, and he was his car was parked, and he was waiting for the people he was waiting for to come out of their restaurant or cinema or something, and he was having a cigarette on on the bridge over the Alma Tunnel, and he heard this this uh, car coming towards him and and he heard a very loud noise and he his conclusion i think was that this the person driving that car had actually uh, engaged neutral and then pressed the accelerator that was the the, the sound of a racing engine uh, not in gear uh, which he described <laughs> Henri Paul and Dodi Al Fayed died almost instantly. Patel went to this phone box and rang the emergency services. Then he went to the nearest police station. He was badly shaken. 
Je me souviens, il y avait euh, un pilier de dossier d'information, vous savez, euh, pour, pour les papiers, etc. Et je défends, je les jette. Et lui, le réflexe qu'il a, c'est qu'il appelle d'autres euh, euh, personnes pour essayer de me calmer. Mais plus on essaie de me calmer, plus je m'y remets parce que je me suis dit, mais merde, c'est un petit Et eux, ce qu'ils ont fait, ils ont le maîtrisé. Quand j'ai mis les menottes, et, euh, ils m'ont mis dans un bureau, on a tourné, je crois qu'on va chercher le, le, l'inspecteur qui s'est fait ça. Et, euh, Princess Diana was very badly hurt when she hit the back of Trevor Reese Jones's seat, but she was not trapped in the metal. Under a flash, the full damage is clear. At 20 to 1 in the morning, Paris Chief Constable Pierre Massoni was told of the crash. He woke his boss, the Minister of the Interior, and then made for the tunnel. Princess Diana was lifted out and put in one of the three ambulances that had arrived by 12.40. By 2 a.m., Police Chief Massoni and the French Minister of the Interior became worried because Diana's ambulance had still not reached the hospital. It stopped twice, in fact, first one kilometer from the tunnel and then on the bridge just 300 yards from the hospital. The French press were told this was because Diana's blood pressure was so low. It took over one hour and ten minutes for Diana to reach the hospital, a distance of three miles. The inquiry never raised the disturbing question, did this delay almost guarantee Diana would die? Cette nuit, la princesse de Galles a été victime à Paris d'un accident de la circulation à grande vitesse. Elle a été immédiatement prise en charge par le SAMU de Paris qui a effectué la réanimation initiale. À son arrivée à l'hôpital de la Pitié-Saltépillière, elle présentait un choc hémorragique gravissime, d'origine thoracique, puis rapidement un arrêt cardiaque. Une thoracotomie d'urgence a mis en évidence une plaie importante de la veine pulmonaire gauche. Malgré la fermeture de cette plaie et un massage cardiaque externe puis interne de deux heures, aucune efficacité circulatoire n'a pu être rétablie. Et le décès a été constaté à 4 heures du matin. Soon after, the paparazzi were arrested. They became the first guilty party, as their lawyer explains. Il y a quelqu'un qui prend son téléphone, qui téléphone euh, à celui qui est supérieur hiérarchique, qui est le commissaire de la brigade criminelle qui supervise l'enquête, en disant place mon garde. Donc, il y a des conciliabules qui se font à très haut niveau, et une décision va tomber, deux placements en garde à vue des photographes. Pourquoi Pour la raison que je viens de vous indiquer. À l'initiative de qui exactement Est-ce que c'est une idée du procureur public Est-ce que le politique s'en est mêlé en disant « la presse anglaise va exploser, l'émotion en Bretagne est absolue, va être considérable, euh, il faut qu'on donne l'impression d'avoir désigné des coupables, des responsables ?» Il y a des choses de cet ordre-là qui s'est, qui s'est passé. With the paparazzi under arrest, the police took no notice of what Patel was saying. He had seen no paparazzi around him or around the Mercedes, but he was surprised to find himself bundled into a van in handcuffs and taken to Paris police headquarters. Et donc un officiel qui est venu, dont je ne dirai pas le mot, et euh, qui m'a dit simplement. Euh, Je me fasse, euh, que je me fasse connaître. Et c'est tout. Je me suis lancé tellement cette menace. Et moi, je ne savais pas qui c'était à ce moment-là. Et, euh, et puis voilà, et, euh, ils disent que ça, c'est, c'est pas comme ça que ça s'est passé. J'ai compris, j'ai compris. Et, euh, ils vous disent que c'est pas comme ça que ça s'est passé. Ouais. Est-ce qu'ils voulaient exactement Ils l'ont fait. Et quand il vous disait c'est pas possible, il vous, disait, euh, ça fait... il vous suggérait la façon dont ça allait se passer Non, comme si je n'étais pas là. Je n'avais jamais rien vu. Et... That night, the police briefed the press that Patel was lying. Harry Match's chief reporter had the story from Patel's lawyer three days later. Il est arrivé le troisième ou quatrième jour et nous avons une longue conversation de deux heures. Donc j'aurais pu être beaucoup plus beaucoup plus actif là-dessus, mais 
je, je me méfiais, je ne sais pas pourquoi, euh, les choses sont les plus faciles me semblent toujours un peu inquiétantes. Euh, C'est vrai, quoi, il faut le dire. Donc, euh, voilà, maintenant je sais que euh, Pétel... Qu'est-ce que je sais sur Pétel Je sais qu'il est allé dans ce commissariat et je sais qu'il a été interrogé par la brigade criminelle et par qui Je sais exactement par qui. By suppressing Patel's evidence, the French could blame the photographers. From early September, Patel's lawyer asked the inquiry to hear his client. They only agreed to do so seven months later. Then the inquiry asked the police to explain why Patel's original statement had been lost. Sauf que effectivement, s'il a été entendu par la police, il devrait y avoir un procès verbal qui apparemment, euh, apparemment n'existerait pas, ou en tout cas, euh, euh, qui, qui n'aurait pas été produit. Bon, et vous, ça vous inspire quoi, ça, le fait que... Ben, ça m'étonne énormément, d'autant que j'ai toujours pensé que, pour diverses raisons, euh, que M. Pétel disait la vérité. Alors je ne comprends pas très bien qu'on n'ait jamais pris en compte son témoignage. The police first claimed Patel was a liar, and second, that he didn't speak clearly enough. Yes, there had been a call to the emergency services, as Patel claimed, but the caller said he was speaking from Armand Marceau, not Alma Marceau. No such place as Armand Marceau exists. Harrod's head of security had worked at Scotland Yard for 26 years. My first concern was I'd learned that the bodyguards had decided not to deploy a backup vehicle, a protection vehicle, which was contrary to all of our own rules. That surprised me greatly. Uh, I was also very surprised when I learned, particularly from television footage, that the French police had not isolated the tunnel to preserve it for evidence. Whether this was something other than a traffic accident or not, something of this magnitude involving Diana, Princess of Wales, the scene should have been preserved. These extraordinary images are from that night. Vers 7h du matin, et je suis allé à, je suis rentré à, au tunnel, par, tunnel de l'Alma, au tunnel de l'Alma, parce que euh, je voulais voir euh, l'intérieur. Euh, et je croyais, j'étais sûr que ça, ça c'était toujours euh, fermé, mais, euh, mais c'était complètement ouvert. Et ça m'a beaucoup surpris, hein, parce que c'était Diana, <rire> elle était morte, c'était une grande affaire. Et j'aurais pensé que la police aurait fermé la, le tunnel pendant même plusieurs euh, journées. Euh, mais c'était complètement ouvert euh, vers 7 heures du matin. Shortly before dawn, the propriété de Paris, the green vehicles which sweep the streets, sprayed detergent in the tunnel. Not the best way of preserving forensic evidence. Was it a clean-up or a cover-up? The most famous woman in the world had died. Happy birthday! As Diana's body was brought back to Britain, everyone here expected a thorough investigation, like an inquest. But France does not have public inquests. The government appointed a middle-ranking judge, Hervé Stéphane, to carry out an inquiry into what caused the deaths. He worked to rules that haven't changed much since Napoleon. Uh, first of all, you have something which is called the secrecy of the investigation in France. That means that apart from the investigating judge and the parties, the parties being really, really limited to the lawyers and the prosecutor, no one has access to the prosecution, no one has access to the file, no one has access to the evidence. So the media don't know anything 
um, the public does not know anything and nobody can verify what's in the file. I do feel that the French have a system with uh, um, we're unlike ours, which we call the accusatory system, where you get two sides against one another. Over there, they have the um, inquisitorial system, where an officer of the state um, conducts the inquiry with the assistance of the police. And, of course, all officers of the state are paid by the state and beholden to the state. And uh, one is, shall one say, in no circumstances, sceptical as to whether or not there can be interference from above. The standard accident investigation carried out by French traffic police has never been made public and does not form part of the official report. But Patrick Chauvel, a well-known French photographer, did speak at some length to traffic police who carried out the original investigation. They made their own investigation, of course, but then they had pressure from the Elysee who told them to keep it low. You know, and they were not very happy about that because they made their own inquiry and that's their job so they don't like to be pushed you know when they're doing their job honestly 36 hours after the crash the French authorities changed their view it was no longer the fault of the paparazzi but a drink driving accident an explanation they still insist to be true Good evening. The Paris prosecutor's office disclosed today that the driver of the car in which Princess Diana was fatally injured had an illegal blood alcohol level. He said to have been more than three times over the French limit and twice the British one. There was also more evidence today about the speed at which the car was traveling when it crashed. A police source said the speedometer was found frozen at more than 120 miles an hour. Within just over 24 hours of this crash, when it was put out that this was caused by a drunk driver, a person drunk as a pig, driving at 192 kilometers, they were false statements. They were certainly false statements then, and we know they're false statements now. And one of the reasons we know that is that the statement as to the drink drive was put out before Henri Paul's body samples had even been fully analyzed. So they didn't have an analysis report of this, and yet it was put out that he was drunk, severely drunk. They also said that the speedometer of the car was stuck at 192 kilometers per hour. That was refuted immediately by Mercedes themselves, who said on impact, the speedometer of the car reverts to zero. Now, that's something they had to concede right away. The files show the inquiry tried to work out the speed of the car. Mercedes were paid to carry out crash tests, although their experts were never allowed to inspect the vehicle. But what is not in the files is another picture, which could have given a quick and clear answer to the speed, as Chauvel heard from the traffic police. Well, this guy, Wellman, was pissed of the pressure, and he said, I'm going to show you something. And if ever this goes bad, maybe I'll f forget the photo on my office and you can sort of take it. And it was a photo taken by the flash of, there's a flash, there's a camera, in, uh, the, there was, it's gone now, at the entrance of that tunnel. And, you know, those flash pictures when you go over 60 kilometers an hour, which is the speed limit. So the flash is a, f a frontal flash. So you, you can see the people in the car. You can recognize them. And on that picture, you could recognize absolutely everybody in the car. And it says the speed and the date. And what were the people in the car like? Well, the driver was normal, if I can say so. I mean, uh, I, I didn't know his face before. He looks pretty... The guy on the right side looks tense. He seems a little bit afraid. Maybe the car's going too fast. And the people in the back are just laughing their heads off, having fun. We asked Chauvel why that photo had never been released. When they made their first comment to the press, the official comment was that the flash didn't work. 
at that time. But then somebody found out that the guy who was driving five minutes before, ten minutes before, in his normal car, got 15 days later his uh, ticket. The files show the final estimate was that the car crashed at around 65 miles an hour, but that was never published. Two days after the crash, French police stressed the car's speed and how drunk the driver was, but the evidence for that is poor. These enhanced images are from the Ritz's own video. They show that 30 minutes before the crash, Henri Paul squats and ties his shoelaces. He transfers his weight gracefully from left to right and gets up again without a hitch or stumble. Paul spent two hours before setting off from the Ritz in the company of Trevor Reese jones Did Trevor Reese jones have any feeling that Harry Paul was drunk? No, none whatsoever. He would, in fact, not have permitted in any shape or form about uh, anybody he had suspicion of having drunk uh, to drive the car. That was, that was an essential part of his job, uh, to ensure the couple's security. The autopsy on Henri Paul was carried out by Professor Dominique Leconte and Dr. Gilbert Pépin. They concluded that Henri Paul's blood had 1.74 grams of alcohol, twice the legal limit in Britain. He also had legal medication and an average of 20.7% of carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide reading is bizarre because such a high level leads to erratic behavior. Pas possible. Car plus de 20% de monoxyde de carbone, on ne peut pas conduire. On ne peut pas se tenir debout. On vomit. On a, on a mal à la tête. Donc on aurait décelé chez M. Paul un comportement tout à fait anormal. Il n'aurait pas pu prendre la voiture puisque je sais, au moins le garde du corps l'aurait empêché de prendre le, le volant. The first thing we wanted was an independent post-mortem, and that was denied, denied without reason. They wouldn't give a reason why we couldn't have one. We then asked for an independent analysis of these body samples, and that was denied. We then asked whether we could be present at any subsequent examination of Henri Paul's body, and that was denied. All of these things without reason. The police got a search warrant for Henri Paul's flat. His friend Garrick had the keys and watched. J'ai eu quand même la nette impression que le, 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 le rapport de, de, comment, de perquisition était quand même un petit peu orienté. Parce que vous voyez, on a toujours fait la... la on a toujours dit, il y a une bouteille de martini dans le frigo alors que... Il n'y avait pas de martini, on disait qu'il y avait une bouteille de, de Ricard, tout d'un coup, il semblait que ce, son, son bar était extraordinaire, alors qu'il était tout à fait commun, j'en ai un moi-même euh, à mm. peu près du même, mm. du même ordre. Et vous dites que vous étiez orienté parce qu'on cherchait l'alcool. Orienté, mm. puisqu'on n'a jamais dit qu'il y avait par exemple 240 bouteilles de Coca-Cola. Il y avait 240 euh, bouteilles Oui, de, de boîtes de Coca-Cola, euh, light, puisque c'est sa boisson euh, comment, préférée, là. Le, comment le, le, le rapport euh, n'en fait pas état, pourquoi Mais le rapport ne s'attache euh, forcément, puisque c'est un rapport qui doit dire que... Euh, enfin, bon, j'en sais rien, moi, je ne suis, suis pas de la partie, mais j'ai l'impression qu'à partir du moment où on ne voit plus l'alcool et on ne voit pas euh, les, comment, les softs, bon, ça me paraît quand même un peu orienté. Et les médicaments Ils ont cherché les médicaments mais Forcément. Et alors Et alors, ils n'en avaient pas. Ils n'avaient pas de médicaments Non plus. The Paul family were denied access to the material in these bottles, their son's blood and urine samples. Backed by al -Fayed, they got four of Europe's top pathologists to examine the post-mortem report. They dissected the autopsy and listed 28 critical errors that made the procedure unreliable. These included that the autopsy was not timed. No proper description was given of how his body was identified. No explanation was given for the 20.7% of carbon monoxide. The final conclusions of the four pathologists 
were damning. The results on carbon monoxide in the blood are inexplicable, as inexplicable as the attitude of Dr. Pépin and Professor Leconte, who continue to present arguments which have no rigor and no scientific value to justify their results. The hypothesis that there was a mix-up in the samples needs to be seriously considered. Twenty-two other corpses were in the morgue that night. The Paul family, backed by al -Fayed, sued the state to obtain their son's samples so they could do a DNA test to check it was really his blood. The French Attorney General took over the case, but so far the family has not succeeded. The judge said privately that the blood was the great mystery of the affair, but he did not probe further. His similar failure to probe Henri Paul's security connections surprised Richard Tomlinson. I do find it really strange that Judge Stefan didn't really, I mean, I was expecting him to go through in great detail all the details of the file and, I mean, you know, I, I could have given him enough information uh, to have, for him to have, you know, identified which file it was and he could have, I mean, it's a, it's a, it takes a brave magistrate to do it, but he could have, you know, asked for a subpoena of the file through the British government and asked for the file. And there's mechanisms to do that. You could do that. Oh, really? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, uh, whether MI6 would agree to it, I don't know. But if there was sufficient pressure, then they would have to, yeah. This was only one of a number of lines of inquiry the French refused to pursue. For Mohammed al Fayed, it was a personal tragedy, but it could also have become a business problem. Trevor Reese Jones's lawyers wanted the inquiry to consider whether the Ritz and the firm that owned the Mercedes Etoile limousine might have been negligent. The Mercedes Diana used had been stolen three months earlier and its electronics ripped out. Had the repairs been properly carried out? We tried to reorientate the investigation on another way, especially towards Etoile limousine and the Ritz. But that the, by that time, uh, the investigating magistrate and the prosecution wanted to come to an end because there was too much pressure, because no one would know the real truth anyway. So it had to be stopped. So it was stopped. And of course, not everything has been inquired on. 27 volumes of facts, speculation and evidence reveal another enigma. Dodie had his mobile phone that night, and yet astonishingly, when the police logged all the possessions of the victims, they found he had no papers, no lighter, no cigarettes, and certainly no mobile phone. All that was on his body was 1,000 francs. Did you get the impression that stuff had been found in the car which we were not told about? Yes, they found stuff in the car, which was not especially unusual. In lots of car accidents, you have dope. But it's, the dope was not in the driver's hand, it was in the passenger, so, so what? But what they didn't like is the pressure. Suddenly the Elysee told them to keep it low. A high-ranking police source confirmed to us Patrick Chauvel's claims that illegal drugs were found in the car and the existence of the speed camera photo which has never been produced. Some evidence seems to have gone missing. Some evidence doesn't seem to have been followed up. In the files, we also found this photograph, taken between 20 and 22 minutes past midnight. There is one picture or two, uh, which is obviously taken from before the car. Somebody has to be, uh, has to drive before the car to take that picture, especially since you see Trevor Ace Jones looking into the mirror. But I can't say exactly where that picture was taken. It was obviously taken somewhere in the tunnel, but I can't say if it's in the beginning of the tunnel, in the middle, or after some sort of accident, or wherever. But it's out. taken in the Alma tunnel? Yes. So who took this photo? We may never know. Seventeen days after the crash, the paparazzi were no longer under arrest for manslaughter, but were still charged with failure to help the victims. The inquiry had leaked Henri Paul was drunk, then another new development which appeared to explain how the accident happened. The police said they'd found debris from a white Fiat Uno in the tunnel. It was suggested the Fiat was in front of the Mercedes.
The Mercedes wing mirror was found at this point, with traces of another car's paintwork and shards of a Fiat tail light. The Mercedes was thrown into the right-hand wall, then hurled across into the 13th pillar in the middle of the tunnel. The police started a massive search operation, but only questioned owners of white Fiat Unos in the Paris area. They drew a blank. But Al Fayed's detectives did better and tracked down this Fiat Uno. Its rear tail light had been fixed and it belonged to a paparazzi. His name was James Anderson. His past was even more mysterious than Henri Paul's. James Anderson made no secret of the fact he had a white Fiat Uno when French television profiled him three years ago. During the summer, Diana had been photographed by James Anderson. He was a paparazzi with political connections at the highest level. He was the official photographer to one French prime minister and friendly enough with another, Lionel Jospin, to share a motorbike with him. Yet French Special Branch was so worried by his history, they'd started to investigate him, as one of their senior officers revealed to us. Au mois d'août 97, nous avons pu apprendre qu'il avait passé plusieurs jours sur le yacht où se trouvaient la princesse et Akayed, ce qui franchement n'est pas très normal, n'est pas très courant pour un, un journaliste. Il était sur le yacht même. Et, et pas, pas une heure, mais il y aurait passé sans doute deux ou trois jours. Oui, ce sont des sources fiables. Richard Tomlinson recalls a figure like Ardenson in MI6. The MI6 have a, have a cadre of people who have their own profession, their own life, they do their own jobs, they can be barristers, they can be all sorts of things, who just happen to have a, a skill which is occasionally useful to MI6, and they sort of kind of work on a short-term contractual basis for MI6. They, they had one guy who was a photographer, <coughs> And his normal job was as a paparazzi photographer, but occasionally he would do work for MI6. French security services had evidence Anderson was in the Alma Tunnel. Et il se serait vanté euh, dans son entourage quelque temps après d'avoir même donc photographié et même enregistré sans doute les derniers instants de, du moins sous le pont de l'Alma de, de la princesse Diana. C'est un témoignage qu'on a recueilli dans son entourage. The widow of one of Andonson's friends confirmed he had boasted to them he was at the scene. He m'a dit qu'il y était. Il nous a dit qu'il y était. Je suis arrivé à des accidents et tout ça. Il n'a pas été pris par la police. Il est parti parce qu'il était malin. Euh, vraiment, James Andonson avait de très fortes intuitions. Il avait l'art d'approcher de nombreuses personnalités qui ensuite euh, sont mortes euh, subitement. French Special Branch became interested in Andonson when they noticed he'd been the last person to photograph and one of the last to talk with Pierre Bérégovoy, the French Prime Minister who killed himself in 1993. Euh, James Andonson pouvait sans doute ne pas travailler seul et être, euh, euh, être manipulé ou dirigé Euh, soit par euh, un service ou des services, soit par une équipe qui, à un certain moment, et pouvait être chargée d'éliminer ou, ou de gêner ou de compromettre une personnalité et en dansant euh, faisait sans doute office d'agent de renseignement. On a évoqué le, les liens que pouvait avoir euh, en dansant euh, avec des services anglais euh, ou services français. Cela n'a jamais été formellement prouvé. Mais euh, c'est une hypothèse qu'il ne faut pas exclure. Et toutes, euh, toutes ces suspicions sont nées des, des personnalités qu'il fréquentait, qui n'étaient pas des personnalités banales. Hein. Il y avait de nombreuses personnes euh, liées, je vous ai dit tout à l'heure, au, au commerce international. Euh, et puis il y a surtout les conditions absolument ahurissantes de sa mort, qui, qui ont interpellé de nombreux observateurs et qui ont conduit 
à axer ses recherches, les recherches sur la véritable nature des activités d'Andonson. En juin 2000, Andonson a apparently committed suicide by setting fire to himself in his car on this piece of army land. He left no suicide note, his body was found by French commandos. Both friends and even the funeral director are very skeptical that Andonson really killed himself. None of this was ever mentioned by the French inquiry. James Andonson was only one reason why there was pressure not to explore certain irregularities about the accident investigation. The first witness on the scene was ignored and deliberately discredited. A proper traffic accident investigation was apparently suppressed and the victim's possessions had apparently vanished. The dead driver's autopsy was clearly flawed, yet formed the basis for the main conclusion that drunk driving was to blame. The driver and another key witness had strong Secret Service connections, but these were never explored. For the millions who admired Diana, the questions we've raised will be disturbing. A British inquest promised nearly six years ago has still not taken place. Even though it's standard practice in the event of an unusual death when a body is brought back to the UK for burial. Such an inquest might offer the true explanation for the crash and it would still be possible after all this time. The wreckage of the Mercedes is in storage. We tracked it down to a lot outside Paris. It's in this orange container. One key witness is dead, but many others are still alive. It may have suited the French authorities to blame this man, the driver, Henri Paul. But we know the real causes for the crash that killed Diana were more complex and murky. The truth has been suppressed, and possibly suppressed for good. Pierce advises, 